Welcome back to the respiratory chain in biochemistry. My name is Kevin Tokov. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. All right, so in this video, we're going to talk about ATP synthase, and we're actually going to do that for a couple of videos. ATP synthase is obviously very important because it's the source of the most of the ATP that we produce at any given time. The exception is under highly anaerobic conditions, but under rest conditions when we're just in school taking an exam, you know, this is the majority of the ATP that we produce. So just to do a quick review of what we're talking about. Down here we have the mitochondrial matrix. Up here is the inner membrane space. Now we talked about in other videos in the past, complexes 1, 3, and 4 pump protons from the matrix into the inner membrane space. Okay? Now, because the concentration of protons out here is very high relative to inside the matrix where it's pretty low, because they're pumping protons up like this into the inner membrane space, it's actually active transport, and that's why they're termed proton pumps. A pump is a name you give a transporter that is doing something, is doing transport actively. Okay? Now, these pumps don't get energy from ATP. They're getting it from electrons, like NADH and FADH2. Okay, so not all active transports actually have to use ATP. Some of them can use other energy sources. In this case, it's NADH and FADH2. And the energy from those is powering the pumping of protons from the matrix into the inner membrane space. Now, again, because we have a high amount of protons out here and it's relatively low in the matrix, we have what's called an electrochemical gradient. Okay? First of all, the concentration of protons is higher in the inner membrane space and lower in the matrix. And that's going to tend to make these protons unhappy up here, and so they're going to want to diffuse back into the matrix somehow. Okay? But also, overall, because of all the protons out here, in the inner membrane space, it's more of a positively charged environment, and in here, it's more of a negatively charged environment. So also, according to electrostatics, which you learned about in physics, these charges are also going to want to diffuse somehow into the matrix, because they're going to want to reach equilibrium both in terms of concentration and charge. And that's what is the electrochemical gradient. Over here, this blue structure that's very massive, this is ATP synthase. Okay? And you see the net reaction here of ATP synthase. It's going to take adenosine diphosphate plus inorganic phosphate and condense them into ATP. How does it do that? Well, from a simplistic point of view, there's a channel in ATP synthase, and it's going to allow these protons that are built up in the inner membrane space to rush back through ATP synthase back into the matrix. Now, why would it do that? Have you ever seen um, this analogy, which actually occurs in real life? If you have a water wheel next to like a waterfall or something, and the water falls down the waterfall and it pushes and spins the water wheel, and then the water wheel spinning creates some electricity. Okay? In other words, we're just taking water flow down the waterfall. It powers the spinning of the water wheel, and that produces electricity. Some, some places and some um, more, I guess you could say, rural areas actually use that kind of power generation. That is the same way ATP synthase works, sort of on a, on a very simplistic level. The protons moving through here, they provide kinetic energy, which causes this part of ATP synthase to rotate, Okay, just like a water wheel. When, hy when hydrogen ions, protons, move through here, a part of ATP synthase rotates, and that rotation powers the synthesis of ATP from ADP and phosphate. Okay? So we're going to go over how that works and do a little bit of the structure of ATP synthase, because believe it or not, actually understanding the structure is really important for understanding its function. Okay? The first parts I want to go over are beta and alpha subunits, which are actually exposed into the matrix. The beta subunits alternate with alpha such that there's three betas and three alphas that surround this gamma stalk. Okay, the beta and alpha are shown in blue. Specifically, the beta subunits bind ADP and phosphate. Okay? The alpha subunits, their function is to link together the beta subunits in an alternating fashion, and they can bind ATP, although that's not going to be their main function. Okay? The main thing is that they just link the beta subunits together and the beta binds ADP and phosphate. Okay? The gamma subunit rotates. Okay? Now, the alpha and beta subunits, they do not rotate. They're static. So you have to imagine these alpha and beta, they're just static right there. They don't, they don't rotate, they don't move, they're stuck there. But the way to sort of think about it is the gamma stalk in the middle that goes to the center of the alpha and beta ring, it rotates. 
The gamma subunit rotates, but the alpha and beta are static. So try to picture that in your mind. The gamma rotates. And actually, in another video, we'll actually have an animation of this, so you can hopefully get a better intuition. What causes the gamma subunit to rotate? Well, it's because the C subunits also rotate. The C subunits also rotate. The C subunits all contain what are called proton half channels. So the protons are actually, as we'll see in another slide, are going to move into the C subunits, and then they're going to exit on the matrix side somehow. Okay? And when the protons move through the C subunit, that causes the gamma subunit to rotate. Okay? Now the A over here, this is actually the site of proton entry into the C subunits. But the point is, is that when the protons enter into the C subunits, the C subunits all spin like this, and that causes the gamma subunit to spin and sort of grind against the alpha and beta subunits. Now, when the gamma subunit grinds against the alpha and beta subunits, it tends to cause the alpha and beta subunits to change conformation. They don't, they don't move or spin, they just change conformation. And that's what we're going to sort of look at here. I sort of like this picture up here, um, even though it's, it's put a little bit differently um, than it was here. Remember, the protons enter from the inner membrane space side. So down here, this is actually representative of the inner membrane space. Up here is the matrix, okay? Over here is the A subunit. So what you see is a proton entering through the A subunit, and then it's going to go into sort of the C subunit right here. Okay? This proton half channel in the A subunit termed Roman numeral 1, this is the site of entry, and then the, the half channel termed Roman numeral 2 is the exit side. Okay? The proton will always enter into the 1 half channel, the one designated as 1. And from there it's going to go into the C subunit. Now, the way you have to imagine this, the A subunit doesn't rotate. But the C subunits all rotate around. So a proton's going to enter here, okay? And then the C subunit's going to rotate around. So I'm following one proton. One proton's going to move around right here where my mouse is. And then it's finally going to end up in this half channel, term two, and then just exit. Okay, let's follow the mouse again. Proton's going to enter half channel one, go into one of the C subunits, and then they're going to keep rotating around. I'm just following one proton. It's going to move around the back here, okay? And then it's going to end up in this half channel term two and exit on the matrix side. That spinning of the C subunits relative to the A subunit also causes the gamma stock to spin. This is gonna spin around and around. In fact, the net spin is 120 degrees for every spin. And since there's 360 degrees in a circle, that means the gamma subunit has three possible main conformations. It's either at 120 degrees, 240 degrees, or 360 degrees, okay? So this gamma stock, it's gonna spin against and grind against the alpha and beta subunits, okay? And if this picture helps you a little more, um, you can look at this one, but I, I particularly like this picture. Now, as we'll see, there are three conformations of the alpha and beta subunits, O, L, and T, which stand for open, loose, and tight. And we're gonna look at that here. Now, in the next uh, video, we're gonna actually going to look at the, the actual physical mechanism of the ligation of ADP to phosphate to make ATP. Here I just want to give you the mechanism of the alpha and beta subunits. The O is designated for open, L is loose, and T is tight. The gamma subunit has this, basically, it has a certain... Um, shape to it, and it, although it doesn't necessarily look like this little spike sticking out, the spike points to the open region, okay? Always points to, uh, the, the spike of the gamma subunit points toward the open part. So what is the open part? Here are the functions right here. The open conformation, so hopefully you see in the open we have ADP and phosphate coming in, and the ADP and phosphate bind in the, in the particular alpha-beta part that has the open. Notice over here, this alpha and beta is loose, and this alpha and beta is tight, okay? So ADP and phosphate bind in the open conformation. And we'll see also at the very end of this that if there's an ATP in the open conformation, then the ATP can dissociate, okay? But in general, ADP and phosphate bind in the open conformation. Whenever we get a proton flux, remember protons moving through the half channel, the C subunits rotate, which causes the gamma subunit to, rotation, to rotate. When we have that proton flux, there's a 120 degree rotation of the gamma subunit. Notice, the gamma subunit rotates, now it's pointed this way. Okay? That causes all these conformations to change. This was open, now it's loose. This was tight, now it's open. 
This was loose, now it's tight. In fact, every region is going to cycle between open, loose, tight, and then back to open, loose, tight. So see this part here that had the ADP and phosphate that bound? The open conformation sort of just holds them eh, kind of close. Okay? It at least holds onto them so they don't really dissociate. Once that part, that, that catalytic site, gets into the loose conformation, the ADP and phosphate are put closer together. Okay? It's sort of tight binding, but it's not super tight. It's loose, but it still puts the ADP and phosphate relatively close together. Then what's going to happen is we'll get another 120 degree rotation of the gamma subunit, and this L site will turn into a T site, a tight conformation. And that tight conformation forces the ADP and phosphate so close together that it actually forces them to ligate to form ATP. Another way we can look at it is right here. Look at this one that's already loose. Remember, we would have previously had this in the open conformation before the gamma subunit rotated, but this is in the loose conformation, so the ADP and phosphate there are pretty close together. They're held there pretty close. Rotation of the gamma subunit, remember we cycle O to L to T, O to L to T, so this L becomes a T. This catalytic site turns into the tight conformation, and it's going to force that ADP and phosphate so close together that it forces them to become ATP. This one is already tight, okay? The ATP is already formed. It was in the tight conformation. It forced the ADP and phosphate so close together that the ATP was actually formed from ligation. Rotation of the gamma subunit, it goes into the open conformation. Remember, it cycles O to L to T, open to loose to tight. So if we start at tight, we go back to open, and the ATP dissociates. So actually, the alpha and beta subunits are grouped in groups of two. There's an alpha-beta right here, there's an alpha-beta right here, and an alpha-beta right here. Meaning, there's actually three catalytic sites on ATP synthase. There's three sites for ATP synthesis. Three different sites. Okay? So basically what it means is, first there's going to be an ATP formed here, then an ATP formed here, then an ATP formed here, then ATP formed here, 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 here. So, there's three catalytic sites, so simultaneously on three different points of ATP synthase, on the alpha-beta parts, there's going to be three sites of ATP synthesis, but they're all going to be in a different stage of the synthesis, either ADP and phosphate binding, which is open, loose, in which they're being forced together, and tight, which is where they're being forced so tightly together that ATP is formed. Okay, Hopefully that makes a little sense. And in the next video, we're actually going to go over the mechanism of ATP synthesis by ATP synthase. All right. Make sure to like that video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.